Well, good. Uh, hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. It's that time of the week again. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another action-packed episode. We've got a lot more content to go through, and we're actually going to be introducing a brand new series uh, starting today, a little, you know, little uh, weekly shorts uh, from Dennis Prager. Um, but I'm going I'm, I'm to start off, uh, we usually give you the countdowns. We have 301 shopping days left until Christmas, and we only have 46 more weeks until the next presidential inauguration. Now, of course, that's 46 weeks and five days. Uh, but don't forget, Monday is Leap Day. So for all of those who are, are avid viewers who were born on February 29th, happy birthday. Since our show was not on four years ago, I couldn't uh, wish you happy birthday on the previous show, so I'm going to do that now. So happy birthday to everybody who was born on Leap Day. And... Uh, we appreciate your watching. Uh, another reminder for the, those who are for first time viewers and for those are, who are regular viewers of this show, we have all of our episodes and some special content on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Northstar Oasis. And with that, we're going to get right into the content because today we are going to introduce a new series, uh, about five minute shorts. We're going to play one a week for the next 11 weeks, starting today, and then is on the topic of the Ten Commandments. Now, you may look at me and say, well, what in the world are you doing the Ten Commandments for? And really, the answer is simple, and it's, it's because in order to create an orderly society, we have to have a basis in the rule of law. We had discussed a week or two back about uh, the Supreme Court, and we're going to be having that Supreme Court fight coming up here in the not too distant future. And there's going to be questions about natural law and where does the law originate from. We do a lot of history on, on our show and we look back into the origins of, of things, the origins of our law. Where, do, where does our law come from? Why is it important? Those are the questions that we ask and, and I try to provide answers on a weekly basis. And so it's really nice that with Dennis Prager, with Prager University, put together an 11-part series on the Ten Commandments. So we're going to give, give you the introduction here in just a minute. And then each week he takes on one of the commandments and really ties it all together well with what is going on in our society today and how the Ten Commandments are relevant to our daily lives and a harmonious society. And that's one thing we do try to preach here is a harmonious society. And the other interesting thing is that um, we have the Georgia Guidestones, which are considered the Ten Commandments of the Antichrist by some, uh, which are down in Elbert, was it Elbert County? Uh, yeah, Elbert County, Georgia. There was a granite monument erected in 1980, but then there's other things associated with this. And we're going to take a look at how the secular version of the Ten Commandments from the Georgia Guidestones contrast with the Judeo-Christian Ten Commandments of the Bible. So with that, we're going to take a look here at the introduction put out by Dennis Prager. And, well, while, while we're waiting for that, there's also an Earth Charter put up by Marie Strong and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. And that's really, you know, the Guidestones are one thing, but really it's the Earth Charter is, is the other. And when the Soviet Union fell back in 1990 and Mikhail Gorbachev had already opened up the Soviet Union with perestroika and glasnost. Back when I was in high school, and I actually remember when this happened, he had, Gorbachev had shifted. He shifted his focus from a nation state into a movement. And that movement really became the environmental movement. And Strong and Gorbachev got together with the Earth Charter and we're going to contrast how that compares with the Ten Commandments. But right now we're going to look at Dennis Prager's introduction to the Ten Commandments. No document in world history so changed the world for the better, as did the Ten Commandments. Western civilization, the civilization that developed universal human rights, created women's equality, ended slavery, created parliamentary democracy, among other unique achievements, would not have developed 
without them. As you will see when each of the Ten Commandments is explained, these commandments are as relevant today as when they were given over 3,000 years ago. In fact, they're so relevant that the Ten Commandments are all that is necessary to make a good world a world free of tyranny and cruelty. Imagine for a moment a world in which there was no murder or theft. In such a world, there would be no need for armies or police or weapons. Men and women and children could walk anywhere at any time of day or night without any fear of being killed or robbed. Imagine further a world in which no one coveted what belonged to their neighbor, a world in which children honored their mother and father and the family unit thrived, a world in which people obeyed the injunction not to lie. The recipe for a good world is all there in these ten sublime commandments. But there is a catch. The Ten Commandments are predicated on the belief that they were given by an authority higher than any man, any king, or any government. That's why the sentence preceding the Ten Commandments asserts the following. God spoke all these words. You see, if the Ten Commandments, as great as they are, were given by any human authority, then any person could say, who is this man Moses? Who is this king or queen? Who is this government to tell me how I should behave? Okay, so why is God indispensable to the Ten Commandments? Because, to put it as directly as possible, if it isn't God who declares murder wrong, murder isn't wrong. Yes, this strikes many people today as incomprehensible, even absurd. Many of you are thinking, is this guy saying you can't be a good person if you don't believe in God? Let me respond as clearly as possible. I am not saying that. Of course there are good people who don't believe in God, just as there are bad people who do. And many of you are also thinking, I believe murder is wrong, I don't need God to tell me. Now that response is only half true. I have no doubt that if you're an atheist, and you say that you believe murder is wrong, you believe murder is wrong. But forgive me, you do need God to tell you. We all need God to tell us. You see, even if you figured out murder is wrong on your own, without God and the Ten Commandments, how do you know it's wrong? Not believe it's wrong, I mean know it's wrong. The fact is, you can't. Because without God, right and wrong are just personal beliefs, personal opinions. I think shoplifting is okay, you don't. Unless there is a God, all morality is just opinion and belief. And virtually every atheist philosopher has acknowledged this. Another problem with the view that you don't need God to believe that murder is wrong is, a lot of people haven't shared your view. And you don't have to go back very far in history to prove this. In the 20th century, millions of people in communist societies and under Nazism killed about 100 million people. And that doesn't count a single soldier killed in war. So don't get too confident about people's ability to figure out right from wrong without a higher authority. It's all too easy to be swayed by a government or a demagogue or an ideology or to rationalize that the wrong you're doing isn't really wrong. And even if you do figure out what is right and wrong, God is still necessary. People who know the difference between right and wrong do the wrong thing all the time. You know why? Because they can. They can because they think no one is watching. But if you recognize that God is the source of moral law, you believe that he is always watching. So even if you're an atheist, you would want people to live by the moral laws of the Ten Commandments. And even an atheist has to admit that the more people who believe God gave them, and therefore they are not just opinion, the better the world would be. In 3,000 years, no one has ever come up with a better system than the God-based Ten Commandments for making a better world, and no one ever will.
I'm Dennis Prager. And there you have it, our introduction to the Ten Commandments series by Dennis Prager. And we're going to show you commandment number one next week. Now, turning the page to our, our normal conversation that happens at this time, we have the Minnesota Precinct Caucuses coming up on Tuesday. Um, if you take a look, uh, Dallas, we put my computer up here. We are now going into Super Tuesday. Uh, right now, we've gone through on the Democrat side. Today, they have uh, 59 delegates at stake in South Carolina. And it looks like Hillary Clinton has a two to one lead on Bernie Sanders. So she'll come out with even more delegates. But uh, out of how many delegates uh, the Democrats? The Democrats have uh, 4,763 delegates. And right now, as of today, they've gone through 3.91%. Republicans have gone through the first four states. And out of the 2,472 delegates, they've gone through 130, excuse me, 133, so 5.38% of the delegates. So we have on the Democrat side on Super Tuesday, 1,034 delegates up for grabs that um, will then have 1,220 cumulative delegates for 25% of the total Democrat delegates. Alabama, American Samoa, Arkansas, Colorado, the overseas Democrats, uh, Georgia, Massachusetts, Minnesota has 93, uh, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Vermont, and Virginia. On the Republican side, 624 delegates are at stake. That will be a cumulative total of 757 delegates, or 30.62 of the overall total, with Alabama, Alaska, Arkansas, Georgia, Massachusetts, Minnesota's 38, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Vermont, Virginia, and Wyoming. So there's going to be a lot at stake on Tuesday. So you've probably by now have, well, before I get into that, let's uh, take a look also at who has what on the delegate scorecard right now. Not including South Carolina today, Hillary Clinton has 69 delegates of the pledge delegates, the proportional delegates. Bernie Sanders has 52. Uh, Hillary has 17 super delegates. Bernie Sanders has one. And there's 12 delegates, I believe they're super delegates, who are uncommitted at this point in time. Uh, actually, I'm not sure how it works on the, on the Democrat side with uncommitted. There might actually be a formal uncommitted uh, process there. Uh, on the Republican side, Donald Trump is leading with 82 delegates. Ted Cruz, 17. Marco Rubio, 16. John Kasich, 6. Ben Carson, 5. And then of those who have already dropped uh, since the Iowa caucuses, Jeb Bush has four, Mike Huckabee one, Carly Fiorina one, and Rand Paul one. And of the 2,472 total Republican delegates, 1,237 are needed for the nomination, which means we're still early in the process now, but Tuesday is going to be a very big day. Uh, and then also I'm going to point out one other thing. If we go back to my screen, Saturday, March 19th, it's right here where I have my cursor, 60.23% of Republican delegates will have already been allocated and 49.7% of Democrat delegates will have already been authorized or, or, um, or won. So we're really coming up on the meat of the um, presidential nomination process right now. We're getting to that point where a lot is at stake and this is usually what separates the wheat from the chaff. However, on both sides, we're not exactly sure if there's going to be separation. There might be separation more so on the Democrat side than the Republican. But I looked at Real Clear Politics and their average of polls, uh, or actually one of the most recent polls that came out on the national scene between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders was the fact that they're knotted up at 49 and 49. It's a 50-50 race, folks. It's within the margin of error to get the Democrat nomination. So will Super Tuesday actually shed some light on who the Democrat nominee is? We're going to find out Tuesday, but right now it's anybody's game. And then you take a look at the Republican side. When you have a strong candidate like Donald Trump, 
he's got the lead right now, but Super Tuesday, there's a lot at stake. And coming out of Super Tuesday in the, in the succeeding primaries and caucuses, if Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and even John Kasich get involved and, and get enough delegates, is there going to be enough to block Donald Trump or one of the other candidates from getting the nomination and casting that into an open convention in uh, Cleveland this year? And that's stuff that we're all going to start seeing on Tuesday. But that also means with Minnesota on the Super Tuesday calendar, we're getting a lot of exposure and a lot of attention. I mean, we've, we had um, Ted Cruz here, on, uh, um, not Ted Cruz, but um, Rafael Cruz. Ted Cruz's father is actually here today. Uh, and since this is a live show, this is as of Saturday. If you're watching this uh, after Saturday, February 27th, it was today that Rafael Cruz was here as a surrogate. Uh, we had um, Marco Rubio here last week. We had um, yesterday on Friday, we had uh, Bernie Sanders up in Hibbing. And now we're starting to see even more. Um, well, we got another surrogate coming in for Ted Cruz on Tuesday. Oh, excuse me, on Monday. Um, and then we're seeing campaigns and their uh, surrogate packs really step up the advertising and the get out the vote effort. So it looks like Minnesota is definitely in play, at least for the nomination for both sides. Watch the regular mainstream television. What do you see? Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, Marco Rubio, Donald Trump, Ted Cruz. They're all over the airwaves. They're saturated. I'll tell you this, Minnesota TV and radio stations are happy right now uh, because we're getting attention. But that's also to show you what is at stake, that there is a lot at stake in this election, as we'll be t discussing all summer long. So we've got that coming up on Tuesday, and this is also my call, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, if you want to participate in the process, go to your precinct caucus on Tuesday night. Both parties have precinct caucuses. And I'm not going to tell you where to go, and I'm not going to tell you who to support because that is always up to you. And because this show has a wide audience, I'm not going to uh, list off every single precinct location for both parties within the viewership audience because there's a lot of them, especially in the city of St. Paul. But this is your opportunity to cast your ballot and make your voice heard on who you believe your respective party's nominee should be. And we'll uh, find out next week what happens on Tuesday night. And, of course, speaking of, the, of that, I actually have to thank Bernie Sanders for, for one important thing. Um, it was, I was actually looking for the next video clip that we're going to play. And that's when I discovered that Bernie Sanders came to the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport on one of his visits on Eastern Airlines. Wait a minute, Eastern Airlines? I thought these guys went bankrupt back in 1991. Well, it was Bernie Sanders who actually taught me that Eastern Airlines exists again. And they're based out of Miami. It's mainly a charter service. And they do have, I think they have some daily routes, but it's still a very, very small startup airline again under the old Eastern Airlines banner. It's kind of like Sun Country. When the old Braniff Airlines went out of business, some of the pilots bought some of the, the, the aircraft and they created... Uh, Sun Country Airlines. It was a charter operation here to Vegas, Twin Cities to Vegas, Twin Cities to Vegas, and some other places. And then eventually they went to some uh, daily service. So Eastern Airlines is back in business and they're back in the air again. And that's actually really good to see because I remember when they were having a lot of their problems back in the uh, mid to late 80s. And so uh, welcome back with Eastern Airlines. And of course, Speaking of Bernie Sanders, he was up in Hibbing yesterday, and he didn't speak in front of a packed audience, but then on the Iron Range today, is there really any place to have a packed audience outside of Duluth and maybe Grand Rapids? Uh, I do know that the population up in Minnesota's 8th Congressional District is not what it used to be, but Bernie Sanders still felt that Duluth is important and that Hibbing is important. And let's take a look at what he had to say in Hibbing. Middle class, working class have lost wealth top one tenth of one percent have seen a doubling of their wealth. Take that money back. Yeah. Yeah. 
You know, when I hear the establishment, they're very worried about my proposals. How dare you think so big and it's so expensive? Where was the establishment worrying when the middle class was disappearing and trillions of dollars in wealth going from the middle class to the top I didn't see big editorials in the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post worrying about that massive shift of wealth. But now, because we are talking about creating an economy that works for all. Oh my goodness, they are so worried. So let me tell you this, when I talk about making public colleges and universities tuition free, we're gonna pay for that by a tax on Wall Street speculation. <laughs> Our government bailed out Wall Street, now it is Wall Street's time to help the middle class. When I talk about creating 13 million good paying jobs by rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure, I will tell you how we pay for that. We pay for that by doing away with these outrageous corporate tax loopholes that allow corporations, some of which make billions of dollars a year in profit, to stash their money in the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, and in other tax havens, and end up not paying a nickel in federal income tax. Yeah. So we're going to do away with that loophole and invest that money, $100 billion a year, into rebuilding our infrastructure. Yeah. That was a uh, just a little clip that Bernie Sanders was in Hibbing. He is making Minnesota one of the centerpieces of his campaign. And as far as public rallies, Hillary Clinton has not visited Minnesota, to my knowledge, for any public event. I mean, she's had Democratic Party events that she's been where it's been pretty much closed door. She's been here for fundraisers, but as far as rallies and as far as accessibility to voters, we haven't seen anything of Hillary Clinton because believe me, if we had, we would be showing you clips of Hillary Clinton coming to town and coming to Minnesota. So while it may seem that our coverage is a little bit skewed for Bernie Sanders, that's only because Hillary Clinton has not given us the content that Bernie Sanders has. And, you know, we try to, you know, take things as they come, be even-handed with all of the candidates. And if Hillary Clinton were to actually show up Sunday or Monday or even Tuesday, we'd probably be there with camera in hand, making sure that our viewers got a chance to see the other Democratic nominee. On the Republican side, um, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, they've made trips here accessible to the public. I haven't really heard of any of the other candidates been here, you know, been, uh, having been here. I guess Jeb Bush may have snuck into town in December, but I didn't, we didn't know about it until he was already gone. Otherwise, we'd have brought you that coverage as well. So as we take a look at the Republican side, we're going to give you a little bit with Donald Trump, but it's not necessarily good. And for the record, Donald Trump did not authorize this, but it, has, it is making the news waves, and it is something to be very concerned about and that is robocalling. So with that, we're going to go right to a robocall that was made by a PAC, the American National PAC, on behalf of Donald Trump, but not authorized by Donald Trump. I am William Johnson, a farmer and white nationalist. The white race is dying out in America and Europe because we are afraid to be called racist. This is our mindset. It's okay that our government destroys our children's future, but don't call me racist. I'm afraid to be called racist. It's okay to give away our country for immigration, but don't call me racist. It's okay that few schools anymore have beautiful white children as a majority, but don't call me racist. Gradual genocide against the white race is okay, but don't call me racist. I'm afraid to be called racist. Donald Trump is not a racist, but Donald Trump is not afraid. Don't vote for a Cuban. Vote for Donald Trump. 213. 718 3908. This call is not authorized by Donald Trump. 
And that has been making its waves throughout Minnesota. It's not just Minnesota that's been getting these phone calls. It's been a lot of other states in this process as well. And the thing to keep in mind is a few things here. One, first of all, in Minnesota, robocalls are illegal. And as you just saw on the screen, um, and perhaps I can pull it up. I was having a computer gaffe. Well, I can't read it, so I need to uh, hopefully get, um, you know, because you can see on the screen that the result of the um, pre-recorded or synthesized voice messages, essentially it says it's prohibited. And I'm trying to pull it up on my computer. Our internet here is slow today. And here we have uh, 325E.27 of Minnesota statutes. Uh, use of pre recorded or synthesized voice messages. A caller shall not use or connect to a telephone line an automated dialing announcement device unless, one, the subscriber has knowingly or voluntarily requested, consented to, permitted, or authorized receipt of the message. Or two, the message is immediately preceded by a live operator who obtains the subscriber's content before the message is delivered. B, this section in section 325E.30 do not apply to one, messages from school districts to students, parents, or employees. Two, messages to subscribers with whom the caller has, done, has a current business or personal relationship. Or three, messages advising employees of work schedules. This section does not apply to messages from a nonprofit tax exempt charitable organization sent solely for the purpose of soliciting voluntary donations of clothing to benefit disabled United States military veterans and containing no request for monetary donations or other solicitations of any kind. That is Minnesota law. And I think a couple things have to happen from here. One, Donald Trump needs to come on the record and make sure that he repudiates this organization, the Super PAC, and the use of robocalls. At least in Minnesota, he should. Um, otherwise, there's going to be guilt by association. So far, to my knowledge, I don't believe Donald Trump has made, his, you know, made a statement on this. He did pick up an endorsement from known KKK member David Duke, and that... Donald Trump repudiated. So that's the first thing. Two, I think that the Republican Party of Minnesota should um, also make sure that they distance themselves from this because this is obviously a super PAC, does not representative, is not representative of, um, of the Republican Party, but because Donald Trump is running under the Republican banner, what they need to do is make a formal notice and a formal request of the Minnesota Attorney General to enforce the law. And while their message in Minnesota was sketchy at best, the fact is this is something that independent voters and Democrats are going to pick up and run with if it's not quashed immediately. And I think if the Minnesota Republican Party would... Uh, send a official request for investigation and hearing on this matter with the Attorney General. The Attorney General Lori Swanson has gone on the record many times in the past stating how she is in favor of this law and she wants to enforce this law and here is a classic example of the time when you utilize the power of this law and the Attorney General's office uh, to make sure that people who are our voters, and I say our voters, meaning Minnesota voters, because I know Democrats have gotten the same phone calls uh, asking people to vote for Donald Trump as Republicans have. So this is something that concerns voters of Minnesota from both parties and independent voters. And I really think that if the party would do this and the attorney general would actually look into this case, then let let a white supremacist actually be the shining example of how not to conduct political business in Minnesota. And so with that, we did have a couple of candidates who have shown up in the past. Now back in December, Ted Cruz was in town and we never really had enough uh, an opportunity to 
um, give you any of our video clips, even though our the entire video is on our uh, YouTube channel, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis. The fact is we just never had time in a regular show to bring that out because we've had a lot of other stuff to uh, cover. So we're going to give you a little bit of a clip from uh, Ted Cruz back here in December. How fantastic is it that we have such an array of young, talented, dynamic candidates running for president as Republicans? And what a contrast with the Democrats. So now the Democratic field consists of a wild-eyed socialist with ideas that are dangerous for America and the world, and Bernie Sanders. You know, we are here tonight because this country's in crisis. We're here tonight because we're bankrupting our kids and grandkids because our constitutional rights are under assault each and every day. And because America has receded from leadership in the world and it has made the world a much more dangerous place. Well, we need every one of us. And I am here to tell you, I'm here with a word of hope and encouragement and exhortation. I want to tell you all across Minnesota, all across this country, people are waking up. There is a revival. And I'll tell you today, help is on the way. So I want to ask everyone here to look forward. Look forward to January 2017. If I am elected president, let me tell you what I intend to do the first day in office. The first thing I intend to do is rescind every single illegal and unconstitutional executive action taken by this president. But sadly, the corruption has not been limited just to the White House. It has extended across every agency of the federal government. The second thing I intend to do on the first day of office is instruct the United States Department of Justice to open an investigation into Planned Parenthood and these horrible things. The administration of justice should be blind to party or ideology. The only fidelity at the Department of Justice should be to the laws and the Constitution of the United States. I think where we are right now is very, very much like the late 1970s. I think the parallels between this administration and the Jimmy Carter administration are uncanny. Same failed economic policies. Same misery, stagnation, and malaise. The same feckless and naive foreign policies. In fact, the exact same countries, Russia and Iran, openly laughing at and mocking the President of the United States. Now why is it that that analogy gives me so much hope and optimism? Because we remember what happened. All across this country, millions of men and women rose up and became the Reagan Revolution. And then on this past Tuesday, Marco Rubio was in town, and North Star Oasis was there. Let's take a look. Because in 2016, we have a chance to get it right for the first time in eight years. Now, I know that a lot of you are disappointed about the direction of America right now, and you should be. Because this is the greatest country in the history of the world, and it is not fulfilling its potential. It's being held back. It's being held back, quite frankly, by selfish leaders in both political parties, who for the better part of two decades have refused to solve problems. Look at the national debt. The national debt, but people say there's no bipartisanship in Washington. That's a bipartisan debt. Although we've never seen anything like what's been added to it over the last eight years. You have a, 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 so both political parties have, I think, failed to solve problems over the last eight years, but we've never seen anything like the last eight years. 
Because in 2008, we elected a president who wanted to change America. And not change it by solving our problems, but like fundamentally transform it in a way that made it more like another country. And so now you have a president that ignores the Constitution, just literally habitually ignores the Constitution and undermines it. You have a president that's gutting our military. You have a president that's undermining our alliances around the world. You have a president that's taken a government and tried to take over health care and other aspects of our life. And so the result is this great country is headed in the wrong direction. So much so that we, sadly, sadly, we are right now on the verge of being the first generation that leaves the next generation worse off. That has never ha happened in over 200 years of American history. But in all of this, there's good news. And the good news is it doesn't have to remain this way. The good news is that if we do what needs to be done, we have a chance not just to leave the next generation as well off as we've been, but better off than we are. We have a chance to make America better than America's ever been. But we have to do it in 2016. We have to do it now. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I didn't see you guys here. Thanks, guys, for being here. I didn't know there's really young kids sitting here. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm really glad you guys are here. Young kids, let me guess your ages, between six and 12, right? How old are you, 12? 11, I'm pretty good, man, I can spot it. You're five, how old are you? Four, five, six? He won't say, he's holding out. Do you have a job yet? No? Well, I'm glad they're here because it reminds us of what I just said, that what's at stake is what will America look like when these young kids here are my age or younger, when they graduate from college, when they start a family or a business or buy their home. That's what's at stake here. That's what we get to decide. But first, we have to win. We can't do any of these things that we're going to talk about today if we don't win the election. And that means we have to nominate someone in the Republican Party that has a chance of winning the election. Well, even though you couldn't see the kids off camera, uh, actually they're sons of, uh, you know, the kids from a good friend of mine who uh, brought them over to see a presidential candidate. You know, I happen to have friends on all sides of the political spectrum. I've got Hillary Clinton supporters, Bernie Sanders supporters. I've got Gary Johnson supporters, a libertarian candidate, uh, along with, you know, people who support Donald Trump, people who don't care at all about the process, along with Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, John Kasich, even Jeb Bush supporters. I mean, I've got a lot of friends out there. And, um, so, you know, it's, it's really nice to see that a friend of mine was able to bring his kids and give them the opportunity to see a presidential uh, campaign in, a presidential candidate, you know, right there in action up front and up close and personal. Uh, but that was last Tuesday. We had uh, Marco Rubio in town. So, you know, Minnesota's heating up. We have 93 Democrat delegates at stake and 38 Republican delegates at stake. So Tuesday's going to be a late night for a lot of us who pay attention to the stuff as we pick apart and, uh, and analyze the results to make sure that we give you the most up-to-date information uh, on North Star Oasis. Now, when we take a look at the presidential campaign in 2016, have we looked at other times in history when we've had things as, as divisive as they are now between the two major parties? And the answer is actually yes. We've actually had a few four-way races before. And we go back to, I think it was 1824, that election, which we covered a month ago, uh, was, I believe, a four-way race when we had, uh, might have even been a five-way race, when we had the... Democratic-Republican ticket, and it was um, and we literally had four Democratic-Republican candidates, one-party rule, uh, right at the era of good feelings, and Andrew Jackson came up with the most votes in the uh, popular election, the most electoral votes, but not enough needed to win, and then it was cast in the House of Representatives, and John Quincy Adams ended up winning that election. Then we had a four-way race also in 1912. 
and that was when we had Woodrow Wilson and William Howard Taft and um, Eugene Debs and former President Teddy Roosevelt with his Bull Moose Progressive Party. Uh, and Woodrow Wilson won that race in a four-way race. Well, we're going to take a look right now at one other four-way race that happened. I don't know whether 2016 is going to be a four-way race. 2016 might, but on the other hand, we might end up having an open convention for one or both parties. And we're going to take a look uh, a little bit here in the time we've got left for uh, you know, on um, the uh, election of 1860. Let's take a look at how tumultuous that was. As the election of 1860 approached, the Democratic Convention met in Charleston, South Carolina to determine who would be their candidate for the presidency. They met in Institute Hall, which was located on Meeting Street until it burned down along with many of the other buildings in the area in the Great Fire of December 1861. The front runner for the nomination was Stephen Douglas from Illinois. He was favored because of his moderate position on slavery and his belief that the territories should decide whether or not to permit it. A split quickly developed in the convention over the Dred Scott Supreme Court decision, which said that it was unconstitutional for the Congress to outlaw slavery in the territories. Douglas disagreed with this decision. Eventually upset with his position, 50 Southern delegates left the convention to form their own. The official convention continued to attempt to choose a nominee, but the rule said that he must receive two-thirds of the votes of the delegates. With the 50 departed delegates, the convention could not establish enough agreement to pass a candidate. After taking votes 57 times, Douglas still was 50 votes short. Interestingly enough, Jefferson Davis, future president of the Confederacy, received one vote on over 50 of these ballots. Since the convention could not come to an agreement, they adjourned in desperation. The convention reassembled two months later in Baltimore and finally was able to gain a two-thirds majority to nominate Douglas as president. The departed delegates held their own meeting in Baltimore as well and nominated John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky. This split in the Democratic Party paved the way for the Republican presidential candidate. The Republican convention met in May, confident of victory because of the splits of the Democrats. The front runners were William Seward, Abraham Lincoln, Simon Cameron, and Salmon P. Chase. Seward gained the most votes in the first ballot, but it became clear that there were elements of the party that disagreed with all of the candidates except for Lincoln. So on the third ballot, Lincoln was nominated and Hannibal Hamlin was chosen as his vice president. A fourth party was formed called the Constitutional Union Party from those who disagreed with the Republicans and the Democrats. They hoped to preserve the union by ignoring the slavery issue altogether. They nominated John Bell for president. The Republicans' confidence turned out to be well-founded. In the election in November, Lincoln carried the North with only 40% of the popular vote across the nation, but he received 180 electoral votes. Although Douglas received 30% of the vote, most of those were in the states where Lincoln won. He only received 12 electoral votes. Breckinridge got 18% of the popular vote in 72 electoral votes from the Deep South states. And John Bell won three of the border states and received 39 electoral votes. Lincoln ended up winning the election because of the fragmentation of his opponents. He was a northern president, elected solely by the north. The minority of the people supported him. He did not even attempt to appeal to the south. His supporters did no campaigning there, and he received no popular votes because he was not even on the ballot. The south saw Lincoln's election as a direct attack upon them by the north. He was elected on a platform of opposition to slavery and a promise to restrict it from the territories. The south had had enough. Movements quickly began to hold secession conventions to decide whether they should remain in the Union. Thanks for watching. A if you historic... enjoyed this video... What was sure. that? Okay. An open convention did give us a historic president in Abraham Lincoln. Uh, un unfortunately, a historic... Uh, an open convention, uh, uh, actually the four-way race also gave us President Woodrow Wilson. What happened after each of those elections came war? Perhaps we will repeat having a historic president in the 2016 nomination contest. 
I hope it does not lead to another war. We're going to take a look now. One person I really haven't talked about during the, um, the earlier clips on, um, on uh, candidates who've been here simply because he hasn't shown up is John Kasich, governor of Ohio. But I wanted to make sure that his words at this time, when looking back at 1860, uh, are known to viewers. This is his look back at Salmon P. Chase um, from the 1860 nomination contest. When we were in the, uh, your state house office and the first time I had been in there, and you were pointing out the bust of Salmon Chase and telling me the backstory of the role that he played in the uh, helping to get Lincoln nominated. Do you ever look well, around? Well, he ran against Lincoln, right. but couldn't deliver the Ohio delegation. And Lincoln was smart. When he went to that convention, he knew he wasn't going to be anybody's first pick, but he said, if, if your first pick doesn't get it, could you pick me? And uh, it must have been an incredible convention. And Salmon Chase... He had a, an odd relationship with, um, you know, with Lincoln. First of all, he went into the cabinet as Secretary of Treasury. I don't think he ever really liked Lincoln. Uh, and then he became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. It was an odd relationship, but those were different times. And, uh, and Lincoln, of course, invited his what called a team of rivals into his cabinet. But Chase was, um, you know, he was an Ohio governor. He, um, he had a beautiful daughter, they say, who was courted by people from all over America. And, um, you know, he went on to really make a mark. Do you ever look, find yourself looking at those busts, looking at the fact that, you know, this Ohio was the Republican Party for the first century of the party, and, you know, looking at it from the standpoint of what you're now in charge of? Well, look, um, John, it's, an, it's, a, it's a tricky little, not tricky, but it's an odd situation. I mean, on one hand, I happen to be a Republican, uh, but my dedication is, that's not where my my heart is. My heart is this great state of Ohio and making it better because I've been around long enough in Congress. Uh, you, you're never going to be remembered because you were a great partisan. Um, you know, you make your mark when you do good. So the fact that I'm a Republican, I'm proud of that. Uh, I'm aggressive. I want Mitt Romney to win. But when I sit in that chair down there, I represent 11 and a half million people. And it doesn't, re doesn't matter to me I shouldn't say it doesn't matter, but the, the, the overarching ideas I have are never from the basis of, well, who's a Republican, who's a Democrat, who benefits. And I, I got to tell you, I think that's been hard for people to accept. Uh, I think people... Well, that was uh, John Kasich four years ago discussing Salmon P. Chase and the 1860 conven uh, Republican Convention. And if you take a look at that convention, uh, we had Senator William Seward of New York. Hmm. We have Donald Trump, businessman from New York. Odds on favorite to win it. He was supposed to clean house, but then you had Senator Simon Cameron of Pennsylvania. Well, we actually had Senator Rick Santorum from Pennsylvania in 2016. Governor Salmon P. Chase of Ohio. Well, we have John Kasich, governor of Ohio. Um, former Representative Ed Edward Bates of Missouri. I don't think we really have any Missourians in this election. Um, Associate Justice John McLean from Ohio, Senator Benjamin Wade from Ohio, and former Senator William L. Dayton from New Jersey. And we happen to have Governor uh, Chris Christie from New Jersey in this election cycle. So you notice already from where the candidates are, there's a little bit of a parallel uh, going back from 1860 to 2016. And, you know, what ended up happening, well, well first of all, let's take a look at uh, Seward. You know, he had voiced his opposition to the Compromise of 1850. Uh, he had a hatred of slavery by saying there is a higher law than the Constitution. Goes back to that Ten Commandments we discussed earlier. Um, he had long established support for Irish immigrants. It was the basis of New York City constituency. Uh, he had turned away former members of the anti-immigration American Party. Well, geez, now we're, you know, we see Donald Trump getting support from the American National Party. Um, and when the Republicans met in Chicago at what they called the Wigwam, and, and both parties had wigwams. It was essentially uh, more like a warehouse building, a convention hall. It was made out of wood. It was specifically for the convention. 
And that, that's what a wigwam really was. And Lincoln had said to his advisors, uh, namely David Davis, I authorize no bargains and will be bound by none. That's what he had telegraphed his campaign managers. They ignored him. They lined up delegate support. They won over the states of Indiana and Pennsylvania by offering cabinet posts to those states. Interestingly, and I actually just read last night the entire proceedings of the 1860 Republican Convention. It's about 175 pages. I went through it, every, you know, and literally it's like reading a transcript. And um, Minnesota's eight delegates all voted for William H. Seward on all three ballots. Lincoln ended up winning the election on the third ballot, but he came in stronger on the, second, uh, on the first ballot than I think that people had previously thought he would. Here he you know, was in Chicago, Lincoln's home state. There was a large Western delegation. Mind you, this was the West back then. And you know, there, the first day was a, qu a quibbling over credentials reports, which kind of happens at the conventions today. The first thing they do is how many people are are seated, let's quibble over what the authorized uh, voting strength is of the convention, and let's quibble over the rules, and then let's adjourn. And then they come back and they hit the platform. They got the Republican platform done on day two of the convention, and day three was the election of the president and vice president nominees. And Seward, he had won, uh, led on the first ballot 173 and a half to 102. And at the same time, there was just enough going on with Lincoln's campaign managers to turn enough votes so that I got the delegate count here. I had. Um, I had the wrong article up there. So I'm trying to find here. Okay, second ballot, Seward had increased his lead to 184.5 over Lincoln, but Lincoln had come up with 181 as the Pennsylvania delegation had defected from Seward as well as the Indiana, um, as the Indiana uh, delegates had also made a huge defection. And on the third ballot, was when things changed, and that was a, a uh, shuffle with Salmon P. Chase in Ohio, and another Ohio delegate said, actually, it's called the four votes. It was actually Robert K. Enos of the Ohio delegation. He was responsible for getting three of his fellow Ohio delegates to shift their votes to Lincoln, and this triggered that avalanche, and Lincoln ended up uh, winning a final count of 364 out of 466 votes cast. Uh, literally, it was the, well, actually it's 300 and, the third corrected ballot came out with 349 for Lincoln, 111 and a half for Seward, and then Sam and P. Chase had two, Dayton had one, McLean had one half of a ballot, and, and, uh, he became the nominee. And because of the four-way convention, then um, Lincoln became the president in 1860, and then we had the sectional divide that led to the Civil War. Could that happen again? It could. But on Super Tuesday, that's usually when the wheat and the chaff separate. So that's one of the reasons I want to bring up the 1860 Republican nomination because that may look like uh, an open convention and we may have a kind of faction yet again. There's been talk about running a third party candidate if Donald Trump gets the nomination. There's been talk about Trump becoming a third party candidate if he does not get the nomination. But then what happens on the Democrat side? Hillary versus Bernie. If people aren't really happy with either of them, Somebody else going to run in yet another independent party? Where's the libertarian support going to be? Is you know Gary Johnson going to actually pick up some uh, spots because of um, you know just people not enthralled? A lot to be seen, but we're going to take a look as things come up on Tuesday. We're going to show you one last video here, um, and uh, it's just kind of rehashing what happened uh, again in 1860 and how the rivals became friends. And by the way, Bernie Sanders wasn't independent until just very recently. So independent ver uh, bid for Bernie's not out of the question. 
Four men were vying to be their party's nominee for President of the United States at the Republican Convention. Delegates were expected to give the nod to well-known and experienced Senator William Henry Seward, with Ohio Governor Salmon P. Chase, the next most likely candidate, and Judge Edward Bates, another viable choice. The long shot was a one-term congressman from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln, whose previous history at the ballot box was stacked with losses. They were all good men, but Lincoln seemed to lag in both respect and recognition among the competitors. As the balloting began, Seward placed first, but not decisively, with a surprisingly strong showing by Lincoln. On the second ballot, Lincoln pulled almost even with Seward, and on the third, Lincoln registered a stunning victory. Months later, Abraham Lincoln was elected President of the United States. While Seward, Chase, and Bates grumbled about the outcome and envied the new president, Lincoln shocked the political community by appointing his three rivals to positions in his cabinet. The editor of the Chicago Tribune asked President Lincoln why he had made the surprising appointments of men who coveted his position and who might overshadow him with their political experience. We needed the strongest men of the party in the cabinet, Lincoln replied. These were the very strongest men. Then I had no right to deprive the country of their services. What a lesson in wise, big-hearted leadership. Who can tell how history might have been different if Lincoln had not been willing to place the good of his country above his personal pride and ambition? Our decisions may not determine the destiny of nations, but they can influence for good or ill our cherished relationships. How many relationships have been saved when a good soul chooses to be happy rather than envious about a neighbor's success. Interestingly, Lincoln's surprising cabinet appointments not only blessed the country, but also turned political rivalries into warm and respectful friendships. Like Lincoln, we can stand above the fray and applaud the successes of others. We can see the good they have to offer and embrace their contributions. As we do, we will find ourselves and our relationships stronger as a result. And I couldn't have said that better myself. That's why I had him say it. Uh, that was actually from the Mormon, Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Um, I, I just found that it was a very powerful speech that he, he had just given about that point in time. So what's going to happen in 2000? Well, first, what would have history been? How different would history have been if Lincoln did not take his rivals and turn them into friends? How different would the outcome have been if he would have decided to go it alone or take his team and say, the heck with the rest of you? He, you know, choices would have been different. Some areas might have been good, some not so good. But what's going to happen in 2016? We've got historical precedents here. And I guess that's one of the reasons why we bring you these history segments here on North Star Oasis. Well, that's our show for the week. So with that, Precinct Caucus is on Tuesday, and we'll see you next week.